So a couple days ago, I did a video on photographing with intention and what is the intent of a photographer and how do you take that image from the stage where you make the photograph all the way through the post-processing to your final output, whether that's going to be paper-based or whether that's going to be screen-based. And how do you understand and fulfill your vision as a photographer and what is that intent and how does that work through that whole process? And this is going to be a whole series. I'll probably do these once a week. And I really want to get into a lot of the middle ground where we have some amazing tools these days that allow us to do some pretty amazing things with photographs, whether we're using Lightroom or Capture One. They're set up so we kind of have this convenience of being able to select presets in there. But really what I want to do is I want to dig into these and we're going to talk about how to use these tools and what is available to you to realize and fulfill your intention as a photographer. And while we're going to get into a lot of that stuff and it's going to get somewhat technical, I think it's best to start with what happens in front of the camera lens because this is probably, I think, the most important part to understanding what that intention is and how you're going to realize it. And since we're going to be talking a lot about color in these, I'm going to start with a color image today and I want to look at Steve McCurry's Afghan Girl. Now this is a very famous image. It was shot in 1984, then appeared on the cover of National Geographic in 1985. And not only is it a famous image, I would argue that it has become iconic. I've seen this reproduced in murals and in other mediums. And it was something that really spoke to a lot of people. And it was the right photographer, the right image, the right time. To understand some of this, you have to understand the context of this image. This was done in the mid 80s and you have to understand what Afghanistan was like then with Soviet occupation and this woman is a refugee and this intensity in her eyes, everything in the composition with color, with line, with shape all leads into that and I think that this became an icon of what a refugee was during that era and it literally took off. It became an icon. I did a, um, a interview with Graciela Iturbide a few years ago. We had a discussion about that. She had one of her images that kind of took off on its own and became iconic as well, her famous image of the woman with the iguanas on her head. And this kind of beyond the scope of this to talk about that. It is an iconic image, but several people had asked me about this uh, in the comments and on social media after I talked about this photographing with intention and how to achieve this look. And this is where I want to kind of put the brakes on for a second. And yes, there is a definite iconic famous look to this image. And if you look on the internet, you've seen people tear this apart down to all the equipment that was being used. Steve McCurry used an FM2 Nikon with the 105 millimeter 2.5 portrait lens. It was shot on Kodachrome 64. And if you replicate that setup, which is not hard to do, are you going to shoot a bunch of images that become iconic like the Afghan girl? Probably not. So a lot of it, we need to understand what's happening in front of the lens. And then there was also a stage in that. I have never seen the original slide to Afghan girl. We see the final print of this. And Steve McCurry used a retouching studio that was in Georgia at the time. And so some work was done on this, but there's little documentation on specifically what. But all we can do is look at this image and kind of analyze what's going on here. The main thing I want to look at, and I think it's one of the things that creates an enormous amount of interest in this image, is the color palette. Now, let's put this aside for just a second. Let's talk about palette. What is a palette? Well, a palette literally is the flat surface that has rounded edges that a painter uses to put paints on as he or she is working on a painting. That palette usually defines what's going on in the painting, and it's a limited color set. And typically, colorists who have done this really well use a palette that works together and creates interest. So we think of palette as what colors are are used in the final composition. And I want to look at a couple painters first because I think this is really interesting to see what somebody does basically completely from scratch with a painting, which is a little bit different than photography. The first image that I want to look at is from 1663. This is a Vermeer painting and it is gorgeous. And you can see that it has a very limited color palette. There are three main colors that you see in this image. There's blue, you see yellow, and you see red on the tablecloth. Blue and yellow really create the predominant um, interest in the image and the red obviously kind of anchors all that together. But what's really interesting about Vermeer and a lot of the Dutch masters at that time was their renditions of light in the composition. And I think this is one of the reasons this appeals to photographers, sure. Uh, but if you look at how light caters through this image, when you look over on the left-hand side of the image to where light is coming in through the window and then again through a stained glass window, and specifically the woman's arm as it's kind of held up to this light, and all of the highlights and shadows are pretty much rendered in that yellowish tone. And it's a very warm sense, but it also creates all of the interest with minimal color, which is really interesting. Another interesting use here is when you see the blue, it's obviously the most vibrant in her dress, but if you look at the lines in her blouse, it's somewhat more muted and held back. And it's almost as if Vermeer is 
creating a sense of maybe black or a dark brown or something without actually using it. And so it's a very controlled use of color in this composition. A lot of the texture in the wall in the back you can see is actually using blue to create the texture against this warm yellow. And it really works because all three of these colors have purpose in the image. They're there for a reason and they work together and that creates an enormous amount of interest. Another painting that we can look at is coincidentally from the same year. This is Rembrandt from 19, or excuse me, 1663. Definitely not 1963. Um, but anyway, this has even fewer colors going on in it. It's got kind of these reds and yellows, and the reds fade down to the lower tones in the image and the darker shades, and you see that they almost drift into this brown, but it's still kind of this predominant red that flows through there. And then all the highlights with this beautiful light that's coming down are done with this yellow warm color. And so again, you have two colors, so it's a limited palette, and the interest comes in using shades of those colors. Now, what's different about photography and painting? Well, the most obvious difference is that the painter is creating everything from the artist's vision. And so there's an enormous amount of hand skills that are involved with this understanding of color and shading. Some of these things do apply to photography, even though photography, you're limited to what's happening before the lens. You don't actually draw anything or render it that way. But let's go back to Afghan Girl for just a second. I want to look at the colors that are happening here. Basically, you have green, red, which are complementary colors. Colors. Then you have skin tones, and everything works together to bring out the intensity in those eyes. This is a great composition, but those minimal colors are a big part of this. What's also interesting is how they kind of sort of relate to them in some of the, you know, non-important details. But like if you look at, at the cloak that she's wearing, it's got holes in it, and underneath she's got a green garment, and it matches up with what we see in the color on the wall behind her. Some of this was probably done in retouching to match those colors up a little bit, or maybe bring out some of the intensity of some of them. But I think people get really curious about this image from a photography standpoint, particularly today, because these don't look like colors the way they're rendered out of a digital camera. They're warmer. They have that analog look. They have a, 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 a film type feel to them. And a lot of people realize this is a definitive Kodachrome image, even though I think that's really hard to define. And Kodachrome certainly has a big role in here. But what was done to realize the intention of the photographer? For instance, there are no blues. If McCurry intended for there to be blues in here, he might have shot her outdoors and you would have seen the sky in there somehow. But this worked because it's a very limited palette. It also makes it very difficult. And a lot of people have asked, could, could I show you how to get that look so you can do a preset or something? Well, I'm not really sure if that would work for you because first of all, we don't have enough color information to create a preset that's going to work universally in here. What are we going to do about blues? What are we going to do about oranges? What are we going to do about yellows? So those things are hard to realize with a limited color palette. And then I think also, it's not so much is that we're going to create the next African girl if we follow this formula. There's already been one. It's Some consider that to be the Mona Lisa of photography. It's a really special, iconic image. And did Steve McCurry intend it to be iconic? I don't know. That image, I, I've never met Steve and I can't speak for him. I'm guessing it may have taken a couple minutes to make. It may have taken a couple hours to make that image. I don't know. But you, I would actually argue that it was also the 20 years of experience that led him up to that point and I don't know that he was saying, okay, I want this woman specifically with this outfit with a costume crew and we're going to put her against the green wall so bring out the set. It, it wasn't like that. I think it's more of a subconscious thing of here's what I have to work with, making that arrangement work. And like I said, it's the right photographer, the right girl, the right time, the right magazine, the right place. Everything came together and boom, there you have it. Now, I do want to talk about how to realize if that those are the color tones that you're working with and how do we get the red to kind of go that hue and what is that analog look and what does that do? And we're going to get into that when we get into the software portion of that. But I do want to talk about that first because what happens in front of the lens, this is something that people skip over all the time. There are tons of tutorials on how to use software and that's great, but nobody talks about what we're doing in front of the lens. And in case you can't tell, if everything I'm doing is not supporting this, that's the most important part of this image is that limited color palette. You know, another couple examples, if you watch the video that I did last week, I used four of my favorite photographers from roughly the same era, the 1950s, 1960s, and how they all shot on Kodachrome, but all had different looks in the end. Well, some of that is the post work that's being done, but some of that also is what they're putting in front of the lens. What is it they're photographing? What do they like to see? What is their intent? Tension as a photographer, and that's important. You know, this can be frustrating too. For instance, if you're really into Saul Leiter and those really interesting images he did of New York uh, back in the 50s and 60s, and the color palettes that are involved, 
to go shoot those today is actually really difficult. And this is kind of problem with vintage photography is there's a nostalgia element that is, is very alluring to people. I love it. And when you try to go recreate that, it doesn't work because New York City doesn't look much like it did in the 1950s. If you go to New York today, and I love New York City, it's a fun place to photograph, but there's advertisements everywhere. The color palette is really tough to get limited if you're shooting the city because there's all these commercial things that are trying to get your attention. So it's a different approach that you have to take now. And that's the important thing to learn from people when you're studying the great photographers is how did they arrive at their conclusion? What influences me? And then how can I just use my own personality and bring that into what it is that I like? What my tastes? What is it that I want to accomplish? And those are the things that start to define your intent as a photographer. It's a long learning process, but that's how it works. I would love to know what you guys think. We will have another video on this next week. I'm going to put a whole playlist below, so we'll keep all these together. And so if you want to kind of go watch them in order, uh, but I would love to hear what you guys have to say on this. And until the next video, I'll see you guys then. Later.